Uh, good morning. All right. Um, I'm Mark Gilbreth, my colleague uh, from T-Mobile, Brennan. Uh, we're going to walk you through uh, a journey of transformation and experimentation and, I, and uh, I dare say, some positive outcomes. I'm going to set the context first a little bit in terms of the, the broad nature of, of where we're playing in the shifting market that we all live in. Uh, and then I'll hand it to Brennan and he'll talk you through the specific experiences that T-Mobile have had as they've asked some really tough questions and taken on a challenging mission. Um, so, uh, first off, just to start the context set, we're, we're, we're going to have a conversation here for 15 minutes in the realm of hybrid. There are many definitions for what hybrid might be, but from our vantage point, the definition that we carry at Liquid Space is hybrid is a combination of giving more agency and choice, something we've talked about a lot for the last two days, to employees, combined with a range of choice options, workplace, that spans everything from the home apartment that I live in to the co-working spaces that may be nearby, and the very intentional and purpose-built traditional offices that the company might provide as well. It's that full continuum. Hybrid is not, from our vantage point, three days at the office just at an HQ, but rather it's everywhere I might work. And the compelling underlying story here is that hybrid as a definition for companies, by the end of this year, Gartner says it's going to be 71% of the knowledge workforce in North America. And from a T-Mobile standpoint, 95. 95%. I wanted to say 100, but I think there's some people who actually have to be in an office to do their job. But 95 is a good rounding. So three years ago, pandemic uh, forced everybody to take a step back. We all sheltered in place. I thought it was going to be for three months. It ended up being a little bit longer than that. But in the wake of that, uh, many thoughtful companies are, no pun intended, flexing new muscles with regards to how they think about supporting work how they think about supporting gathering, how they think about supporting place in a more economically and environmentally friendly way. And so quickly cataloging a few uh, of those new muscles and or challenges that, that we all, you all as workplace practitioners have to wrestle with, I'll, I'll walk us through that and then we'll hand it to Brennan. So uh, first off, uh, employees are now, many, in many cases, working from where it works. And certainly on many days that may be navigating to the office that they left behind in 2019 whether it's for a celebration or a group strategy session, HQ is certainly still relevant, as is a myriad of other places. A co-working space to meet up with a colleague to collaborate, a space to concentrate near home. We, we heard again and again in the last two days that concentration space is also part of the necessary mix, and sometimes home is not a place where I can concentrate. Noisy dog, noisy neighbor construction, or just simply the fact that the rituals that I built at home sometimes get in the way of me having clear flow space. Um, and of course, uh, large groups coming together, small groups coming together, but hubs, whether that be company provided or whether that might be a co-working space that's more conveniently situate, uh, situated amongst my colleagues is now a part of the mix. Work from where it works is now all of these, not just one. And, uh, and for real estate leaders, pity the real estate leader who's now been handed the task, whether it's by their people leader or their finance leader or their CEO, hey, I now want you to go solve for supporting our ever increasingly distributed workforce we've been hiring around the world. I now want you to solve for great place in all of the places that our people are, rather than just the great places where we had chosen to put headquarters in the past. Additionally, but that's not all. I also want you to rationalize the portfolio from a cost standpoint. Here's your target. Go make it happen. So cut cost, support people everywhere. Good luck. What we're seeing unfold, and it's been quickening over the last two years, is an evolution in the thinking of what workplace portfolio is. It was pretty clear pre-pandemic. It was headquarters and company leased offices. But what's emerged now, and you'll hear about it in terms of T-Mobile's journey as well, is as companies are stepping back into delivering place, as they're stepping back into connecting employees and giving them the means to be able to use spaces, as they're expanding their workplace portfolios, in many cases, it's beginning with on-demand space. It's a safe first step. It may be employees that were hired in places I never had office before. It may be employees that are traveling in the nature of their work and need space in places they'd never been before. But on-demand spokes, and by that I mean the ability to book space for a professional task for durations as short as hours wherever you might need to is now part of the mix. And what's intriguing now as well is that the data exhaust from that type of activity, where are people choosing to work, what spaces are they using, can further inform where you might step back into something more intentional and permanent, where you might choose to put a hub. Right? So uh, our prediction, and we're seeing it unfold now, is workplace now will look like a combination of traditional headquarters or primary locations, 
It will include hubs or dedicated spaces of somewhat smaller scale and in larger number. And I think our, our belief is that for every company that employs knowledge workers, workplace will also be a vast ecosystem of on-demand spaces. Brennan. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it is. That's where we are today, or that's where we're headed. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit rogue here. Um, I don't have slide content for this, but in light of the previous conversation about um, RTO and HR and things of that nature, I report up through the chief people officer. Um, and the important context, I think, for this, con for this conversation is we believe at T-Mobile that we're better together. Um, we don't have a mandate because there haven't been consequences. But since September of 2021, we have had an expectation that employees are in the office three days a week. Um, and that's been a consistent from the top down, as was discussed uh, this morning, um, CEO on down, uh, expectation is that we are better together and we're in person. Um, and so how is that going? And how does it fit with this? Um, in our large cross-functional offices, the HQs, the the hubs um, from the previous slide, we have 70% attendance Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 50% Monday, 25% on Fridays. That is about as good as we expect to get. And when, by the way, attendance, I'm going to go back to yesterday's conversation. By that, I mean the people who are assigned to the office, the people who are within 50 miles, the people who are expected to be there on a daily basis. That's the denominator. Um, so overall, I think that's pretty successful. Um, relative to some of the other conversations I've had. Um, but that's in our large offices. And then we looked at the data after a year or so of this, and we saw, well, we have this vast distributed office portfolio. And in our smaller offices, um, we weren't doing so well. And the question was, well, what, what's going on there? Why is it working here and not there? And what we did is we spoke to the people on the ground, and we learned that well, they're in field-based roles. This is, that's the term we're using now. Um, they're in roles that don't need to be in an office. And maybe a three-day kind of global mandate is not the, not, sorry, I use the word mandate. <laughs> uh, Safe is, space. <laughs> Safe space. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is not the answer because they are managing our stores. They're area and regional managers. They're out visiting their employees in those stores. They are network technicians who are out keeping our network running. They are uh, sales folks who are selling to small and medium business in a market, and we expect them to be out there selling, not sitting in an office. Um, and so it was, it was very rational that they weren't there every day. Uh, and so you know, the, the CFOs amongst us might ask, why did you have those offices in the first place? <laughs> and the answer was, you know, that was the way we used to work. It was like, have employee, need office. Um, so when we, you know, grew our sales team uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, it's like, well, all right, well, we need, we need an office for those folks. And apparently, this predates me, so I can say this, no one was really paying attention to utilization pre-pandemic, which was a forcing function to look at these things with a critical eye and to make some decisions. Um, and so why don't we flip, flip the slide here. Um, so what we decided to do was, yeah, increase engagement, reduce costs. Uh, partnered with Liquid Space, we closed a large number um, of these smaller field offices across the country, uh, and we gave employees a tool that enabled them to meet when and how and where uh, they need to and now, as they want to. Um, now, we've you, this is actually a live shot of our dashboard with Liquid Space, and you can see on the left-hand side we've we're doing some pilot stuff, but. Um, at its core, the way we launched was we gave managers the ability to book hourly spaces. You can see there's all sorts of uh, permissions you can set in here. Um, there are monthly spaces, there are hourly spaces, there are meeting rooms, there are individual spaces, event spaces. But we were very purposeful mm -hmm. um, in giving managers the power to bring their employees together and not to book permanent spaces <laughs> and kind of undercut the savings we were trying to achieve um, on the other hand. Um, and so how's it gone? Um, 4,089 gatherings. We use the word gathering very intentionally because these are employees coming together, not going alone um, and sitting at a desk. 4,089 gatherings, 403 venues uh, in seven months. 
And the thing that's not on this slide, but I'll say it out loud, um, is 80% cost savings. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, CFO like that too. Um, so imagine I was the CFO and I said, Brendan, VP of real estate, I want you to expand the portfolio by 400 locations. I want you to cut real estate costs by 80% and get it done by Christmas. Yeah, and, and that was basically what we did. We made the decision in November of 2022 and we had deployed this in March of 2023. Um, so it was very fast and by the way, thanks for the promotion. I think you just called me VP. <laughs> I made myself CFO, yeah, so. <laughs> Back click again? Uh, yeah, so it's going, we think, really well. We're saving a lot of money. We're still enabling employees to meet where and how they need to. Deep dive. In Actually, by the way, the, uh, every dot you see, whether gray or blue, is a place that has been booked one or multiple times. The blue ones happen to be places where T-Mobile employees were when this snapshot was taken off of yeah. real-time data insights. But if we zoom in on one of those markets, mm -hmm. And this is a really fascinating one. Um, so LA, many, I've talked to many folks here from LA, really challenging market, right? Like our employees, they span from like Simi Valley out to Ontario Riverside, down to Irvine. Like we had five offices in the LA market to support all of this. Um, and three of them, which you can see are kind of the black keys on there. I know that's off brand. Um, they weren't really well utilized, and they were primarily housing these field-based teams. Um, so we kept the ones that were working, we closed the ones that weren't, and you can see, as Mark alluded to, the dots on this map. Look at where employees are choosing to meet relative to where our offices originally were. Some of them are closed, some of them aren't, but it's what's working for employees when they need to get together. There are probably 500 choice options available to T-Mobile employees in the greater LA market. We took away three fixed offices, gave, gave employees sort of effectively infinite choice. They've been and, in 31. And what do they choose? They chose 10x the, the, the range of options that they had been confined to in the past. That just, that, that's, the, that's the experiential part that just screams out to us. Uh, Every choice that was made was probably driven by convenience of proximity or a fit from a style standpoint or, or aligning better with the needs of a colleague or a teammate and, and all in the service of gathering. Last slide for you. Oh, this one's me. Yeah, um, yeah so we used to have uh, a partnership with Regis. I, I won't say a partnership, but we had Regis spaces. History. History with Regis. Um, and we all have, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and now, um, apparently, Mark just informed me that he did the hard work of pulling this together. These are all of the providers that our employees are utilizing today. And what this underscores is something that perhaps a lot of folks don't have quite a, a full grasp of. We all know the names IWG. You've probably all used them. We probably are all familiar with WeWork. It's been an eventful week for them. What, what you may not know is that there are over 5,000 extraordinary purpose-driven, hospitality-forward, enterprise-grade co-working spaces and flexible office brands around the world. It's just as fragmented as the hotel industry. So one of the fundamental things that Brennan solved for was how do I harness all of those choice options, put a rules engine around it so I don't lose control, but, but give that choice to employees. And th these aren't just the brands listed on LinkedIn. These are the brands that he has selected and utilized in the course of just seven months of a program operation. Every one of the employees, and there are thousands that are being served by this, they've all become site selectors. They've all become transaction managers. They've been empowered to be an extension of the real estate apparatus that, that he built. Um, all right, zooming out, last slide, just to sort of summarize and, and to bring a little more language to the title. We, we've been framing these strategies and the outcomes as a hybrid dividend. And the, you know, the, the, the stump speech on it is that organizations that are doing as T-Mobile is doing, that are embracing the giving of choice to employees, um, are achieving two powerful returns. Or we can think of the dividend overall that they're achieving as having two powerful dimensions. Number one, for, and this is, the, this is the primary driver for a lot of companies, number one, there is an enormous place dividend. There's an enormous hard cost reduction that companies are achieving by making a rebalancing from fixed to flex. You know, on his slide he said zero waste. He saved 80% relative to the cost that they had previously. So the place dividend is compelling. There's also an enormous people dividend. And these are the harder to quantify but very real benefits 
whether it is the ability to tap a more distributed talent pool on a global basis, whether it is enabling the employees to do their best work in achieving productivity or work output gains, whether it's loyalty or advocacy, the human dividends arguably are going to yield more from a true impact standpoint, although they're pernicious. They're hard, they're hard to measure, but they're very real. And so, uh, and as we think about how, how best to go down the path of a hybrid transformation, um, what we are seeing and, and what's worked well for T-Mobile and the other clients that we have the great fortune of serving is it begins with choice. And, and that takes a bit of a leap of faith, right? It begins with giving employees the agency and the means, whether us or some other platform, but the means to exercise that choice. So enable choice first, that's step one. Step two, don't take for granted that just giving them choice means that they're going to automatically change their behavior back to gathering. You need to enable gathering and you need to nurture it. There is an element of change management to foster and re-inspire people, or as the last panel said, to, as John said from Stripe, you have to kind of sell it. You got you to go sell and remind everyone of the benefit of that human interaction. Off the back of that, with data like he has now at his fingertips, He's got a, a unique opportunity from the transactional data exhaust of where his people are choosing, where they're acting with their feet, to reinform and master plan his workplace decisioning. He will see in the intensity and the heat mapping of activity, he will see opportunities where he might confidently step back to putting a committed hub back in place. It might be another flex provider, but on a, a year-long agreement, not day-to-day, -day, it might be a leased office again. But off of the back of giving choice, you get better data, which allows you to then make a more data informed, a more value engineered decision about that fixed portfolio. 80% savings, that goes back to T-Mobile, whether they invest that in hiring more great people or acquiring additional telecom companies uh, or, or returning to stockholders, um, it's a virtuous cycle. And so uh, this is our framing from a strategy standpoint on how to think about this and pursue it. Thank you very much. <laughs>